hello, Masia. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm fine. And you? Better than I deserve. It's good to have you here on the stage. Uh, we are kind of in time, so all good. Let's try to share your your screen with your with your with your yeah, give me a sec. Absolutely, no problem. So Masia is a senior develop software developer at Akamai. You know, it's probably the biggest CDN in the world. And it's going to be demystifying probably what's uh, uh, the JSON web token here, which is probably the most prominent technology here for authorization and authentication. But maybe maybe somebody doesn't really know how it works. So hopefully, he'll bring some clarity. Um, in the meantime, he's probably refreshing his browser. You know, those things happen. Actually, yesterday, I remember one of our speakers was not even able to share the screen at all. So we ended up you know, sending the email to me. And then I was presenting on her behalf while she was speaking. It was kind of fun. Uh, those things happen, um, but uh, you know, we'll figure out something. Uh, we'll give a couple of more minutes for Massier to come back. Um, you know, in the meantime, I, you know, okay. I'm back. Again. I'm sorry for that. I need to close the Chrome to give in an access to my desktop. That's that's totally fine. That's Make security. Sure. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, I can. See your thing that's perfect um let's try to put your presentation on all right i'm gonna be leaving here take it away okay so nice to meet you all uh as probably already you already know my name is Maciej trader uh this is my handle you can find me on all of the social networks uh which logotypes you see below uh the very important information uh is that this presentation is available for you offline so you can go to my speaker deck and check, uh, the, to download the PDF to follow the offline presentation, go to the every link, which I am going to, uh, to mention today. So the main question, what the hell is JWT? But before we will answer to that, I would ask you to get deep into your memories, back to the school times, uh, meet the actors, so on the left side, you can see Bob. On the right side, you can see Kate. In the middle, we have a bad guy who is our man in the middle. And the situation is as follows. Bob really likes Kate, but he don't know how to say that. So he decides to write a letter, put it into an envelope, and use his colleagues as a network to provide this message to Kate. But unfortunately, we got this bad guy in the middle who changes the message. And the disaster occurs. The Kate, Kate becomes angry, Bob becomes sad, so they need to somehow solve this situation. So obviously, they decided to use a cipher. They exchange between each other a key which they are using to, uh, to cipher the messages and don't allow a bad guy uh, to read them. So this is an example of symmetric cipher when you are using the same key for encrypting and decrypting messages. But the problem comes when a bad guy, when the man in the middle somehow obtains this key. So now he is he's able to still act as you and decrypt and encrypt message on your behalf. So this is where an asymmetric cipher came. We have two keys right now, the private one used to decrypt the message and the public used to encrypt the message. Public is what you are sharing with others. Uh, those keys are generated using the one-way functions and what one-way function is in IT is the function which is easily to calculate when you know what you are going to calculate, but it's really hard to find factors which you use to calculate the output number. So, for example, multiplying primes is such function. Uh, so how are you generating the keys? The RSA, I picked up the RSA key as an example. So first of all, you need to pick up primes. On our end is 11 and 3. Then calculate the N, which is our modulus. This is the number of signs in the alphabet which we can use. So we can cipher 33 characters. Then we need to calculate the one-way function, which is on our end called phi. So we got 20, and we need to find an exponent for our modulus. 
So the module, the exponent need to be relatively prime to phi. What does it mean is that the greatest common factor of those, uh, the greatest common factor of those numbers is equal to one. So they have just one common factor. Later on, we need to calculate an exponent for the second key. So we need to, uh, to find the solution for the equation where e multiply, multiplied by d minus one divided by c, divided, uh, modulus divided by c gives us zero. And such exponent for our uh, private key with modulus uh, 33 and exponent three is equal to seven. So this is what we are going to use to, uh, to calculate what is our cipher out of the message. So as I said at the beginning, our actors are exchanging between each other their public keys and they are keeping private keys private. So the Kate is able to encrypt message for Bob and only Bob is able to decrypt that message. Our cipher gets more complicated and it's one way. So it's very hard for the man in the middle to act as, a, as a one of us. But what if again someone interrupts the communication and obtains the public keys? So right now he's able to encrypt messages so he can write them. He's not able to decrypt. So some, some would ask if Peter, the bad guy, is able to calculate the private key based on the public key. And this is where that one-way function comes to the action. Because we used primes, it's not very easy to do that. What you can see right now is example of modulus at the very end of the slide, which is 1024 bits length. And it is computed by multiplying the P and Q, which you can see uh, above. So this is about the encrypting. How now using the public and private key, we can ensure who is the sender of the message. So to sign the message, first you write it, later on you compute the hash of the message. On my end, I use the MD5 function. You encrypt the hash with, the, with your private key. So the corresponding public key can be used for decryption. And later on, combine the message together with the hash and encrypt message with hash using their public key. So now the opposite side of the communication can verify who is the sender by receiving the message, decrypting it using the private key. So you are getting the original message together with the encrypted hash, but you can hash that original message, decrypt the hash and compare if they match. If don't, then you know someone is in the middle of the communication. Similar mechanism of signing comes to another scenario where, for example, we have a king and a, and a kingdom which is built of many, many, many citizens. So what king should do to communicate, to announce something to the citizens? Should he ask everyone to generate the private key so and share the public key, corresponding public keys with him? That leads to nonsense because King would need to encrypt message thousands of times for every citizen uh, separately. So what King can do, as you know, King plus kingdom stamp give us an announcement. So if your kingdom is looking for a King, if you are missing one, you can simply subtract the stamp from the announcement and you get a King, of course. So what King can do he is generating the public and private key pair, keeps one key private and shares his public key with everyone in the kingdom. And he will use his private key to sign the message, which will be not encrypted, which will be kept in the plain text. So what King is doing, he's creating the message, as I said. So since tomorrow, everyone need to use the left hand to open the doors. Later on, he hashes the message and encrypts the hash with his private key. And this is what he's sharing with the citizens. 
So now citizen who possess the public key or from king can receive the message, hash it, and decrypt the signature and compare the hashes uh, to make sure that king is the author of the message. And in fact, this example is what most people call JWT. So sharing the messages which are in plain text, but they are signed using the private key cryptography. But in fact, this is called JSON Web Signature. And the example of such token, you can see right now on the screen. It is base64 encoded, but if you will decode it, you will find out the plain text, the header and payload together with the encrypted signature. So as I said, the token is built up from a header, which is called Jose header. It stands for JavaScript object signing and encryption. That's a name of working group which works on standardizing the representation of integrity and protecting data using JSON structures. You have a payload, which is a message, which is message body, and you've got a signature. So let's get back to the question from the beginning of the presentation. What the hell is JWT? So JWT, in fact, doesn't exist itself. It's just, if you are a Java-based person, you could think about JSON Web Token as an, an abstract class, which is implemented, which is uh, adopted by JSON Web Signature or, J or JSON Web Encryption. And the token is built up of claims, which we already mentioned. So we got the registered claims, uh, which you can see in most of the tokens. Inside header, you get information about the algorithm, token type, who is issuing the token, for, for who is the subject of the token, so about who is the information, who is the receiver, when the token has been issued, before what time it shouldn't be used, when this token expires, so after what time it shouldn't be used, or things like JSON, uh, JSON token identifier uh, for the one-time use tokens. But a part of register claims, which JSON Web Token is built of, you can also use custom claims. And those are divided into two groups. One group is a public claims, claims, which are registered within the JSON Web Token registry to avoid name collisions. And another group are private claims, which are a perfect fit for the microservices uh, architecture where you want to use JWT token for communication between your services. So you are sure that there, there is no name collision uh, which could occur. So the token like this one, which use my name and surname and some privileges uh, as an array is completely okay and valid. And this token leads us to the first use case example of JWT. So let's think about the microservices. We have an actor, we have Anna, we have the service which is responsible for signing the author of service. We have the schedule. We, we have the service where Anna can book something and that something is a flight. We have a service which is responsible for managing the gate on the airport and the flight schedule. So if Anna want to do something in the, in the system, she is authenticating, authenticating herself in the reply she probably gets a user ID, which is encrypted using the private key. Using that user ID, she's performing the post, uh, post HTTP request to different services within the whole structure. And Anna is able to only to book the system, uh, to book the flight. So what each of these services need to do, it must ask the auth, auth service, the authorization service, if Anna is able to perform that action. So we have a lot of communication here. If you would like to get rid of this communication, you may feed the services with the public key and ask them to perform that time consuming action of decrypting her user ID and verify, uh, and verify the, her privileges on their own. 
but still it's not the best uh it's not the best way of authenticating user of authorizing user what if privilege if anna privileges would change after she obtained the user id what if uh, of course such uh, such example leads to duplicating the authorization logic within the services so this is something what we avoid let's take a look how authorization may look like if you would use json web token for this task so anna asked for her token she get it in reply the token is signed with the with the private key and now services can make a preliminary check if Anna have this privilege in her privileges array. And if she have this privilege, that's the moment when they are involving the time consuming action of decrypting and encrypting. In other words, of verifying the signature if token is not manipulated. The simplified uh, JavaScript implementation of such authorization looks like that. So first, we obtain the token from the JSON web token header. Then we are decoding it. This is a super simple action. And if token contain the privilege which we are looking for, we are verifying the signature. So this is where the time consuming action comes to the stage. If the whole statement is true, so then we are changing the gate. Otherwise, we are throwing the authorization failure so we can deal with this failure somewhere else in, the, uh, in our application. Moreover, JWT token gives you an ability to delegate the part of the, uh, the verifying claims and ver verifying signature to the load balancer so you can offload your services. Moreover, you can delegate the validation to third parties like Akamai or other content delivery network, which provides you with such functionalities. Within the Akamai, we have a product which is called API Gateway, where you can declare your API together with the JSON web token validation and tell Akamai what are the claims which we should, uh, which we should check on your behalf together with the signature. For further reading on the JSON web token based authorization, uh, I ask you to forward to my publication within the Twilio Voices blog, which is titled Protecting JavaScript Microservices and so on and so on and so on. You can also go on to some Akamai resources about JSON web token validation within the API gateway. Let's go forward to another use case, which is OAuth. Probably all of you met the window like that around the, around the internet, which is asking to sign using some third party service. So how OAuth works? We get three actors right now. First one is your application, is your service. The second one is an authentication service. Let's say it's a Facebook. And the third one is a resource service and let's say this is the Facebook server with the images of person who images you want to pull into your application. So first we authenticate within the service and this is what our user does. In return, the application gets the access token which you are using to request resources like pictures. Then the resource service validates the token against the authorization service. If the token is valid, it's came back to us with the resources. So if we would use the JSON web token as an access token, we could get rid of this additional uh, traffic between resource servers and authenticating authentication server. So that's another use case of JSON web token. Let's move smoothly to another topic, which is JWKS. And this is the term which is answering question like, what if my key get compromised? What if you want to rotate them? What if you want to invalidate someone's privileges once they obtain the token? And this is what you can do with JWKS, which is simply a repository of keys. 
Inside the JWKs, you can keep as well public as private as symmetric keys. But for our example, for JWT, probably you will keep mostly public keys there. So how the, uh, the, the verification of signature looks like. So Anna obtains the token, ask for that, the authorization server. In return, she got a token within which you can see two additional claims in the header, the key ID and the JKU, which stands for the JSON key set URL. Now, when she navigates, when she tried to do something within the booking service, the booking service ask the JKU service for the key with the ID 12. It gets this key, which is used for the verifying the signature. And keys in the JK, JWKS looks like that. So first of all, the key type, the key ID, the algorithm which for, for, with which the key should be used, what for what the key should be used, because as I said at the, at the very beginning, key can be used for signing. It could be used also for encrypting. With, if you are using the JSON web encryption rather than JSON web signature, it also has the exponent and modulus of the, of the key. But that's not all what JWKs can keep. What I showed you just, uh, just in the previous slide is an example of public key. The JSON web key can also keep the certificate, uh, which is related to this given key. It can also keep information related to the private key, like Chinese reminder algorithm uh, helpers, so primes, which has been used to calculate keys, and so on, and so on, and so on. So now let's think about the unhappy path scenario when the attacker obtains the private key from the authentication service so he can sign tokens for him by, the, by himself. So once such attacks has been found by, J, by the authorization server, you can rotate the public keys. So even if attacker will go to the booking, to the gate service with the correctly signed token, the corresponding public key in the repository has changed, so the gate service will deny access uh, for such person. Last but not least, pitfall and vulnerabilities of JSON Web Tokens. So first of all, you need to remember that JSON Web Tokens are used for encoding, not encrypting data. So if you are using JWS, it's a good place for store information like uh, user privileges um, or user login name, but it's really bad idea to keep information like credit card number, user ID, user password, and so on inside the JSON web signature. Moreover, you cannot depend only on the information from the header uh, or when, when you are verifying the token signature. For example, there is an implementation and it's completely valid to pass inside the header that the algorithm which is used for the end for, for the signing is none. So if you are basing only on the header, you your validation, the token which is not signed may pass your validation. Of course, it's, and it's not only limited to JSON Web Token. You should be really, uh, you should really carefully uh, look for what you are giving as a response server. So there were a bug in the implementation of JSON Web Token for .NET, which were showing to the attacker what is the valid signature which should be used to, for this token to pass the validation. Moreover you should always follow the best practices of the algorithm which you used for signing. So for example, the HS256 is just applying twice the SHA-256 uh, hashing algorithm. So it might be easily, uh, it might be easy to retrieve the key which is used to perform the signing process once you get the signed token. You could, uh, you could do that using software like Hashcat or other mech or other brute force, 
uh, brute force software. But if you would follow the, the best practices uh, which are mentioned in the documentation, so you would get enough uh, secure key, probably you are secure with using this particular uh, signature algorithm. What you need also to remember is that decoding token is not verifying it. You should treat decoding as a hash code equivalent in Java. So you could use decode to preliminary check JSON web token. To verify it finally, you need always to verify the signature. So in Java, if you want to check if two objects are equals, you are using equals method, which makes a deep check. But if you want to just check if two objects are not equal, you can use hash code, which will quickly check if two objects uh, calculate the different hash codes. Uh, we are running out of time, so I will skip this and I will go to one of my favorite things. Always remember to validate the JKU claim because what attacker can do, he can set up his own JWKS uh, repository and use his public keys for validation so your service won't even check your, author, your JWKS uh, to query for public keys. And this is why when you are, for example, uh, configuring within the Akamai API gateway, your API for JWT validation, we are asking what are the URLs which you are trust as a JSON web key storage URLs. Uh, so summarizing, JSON Web Token is often confused with JSON Web Signature, which is just one of implementation. Very important, it's not a best place to keep sensitive data. Uh, resources, which I recommend you for further reading. And as I said, you can, uh, you can get them in presentation, which is available on speaker deck. I would also kindly ask you for a feedback what you like and what you didn't like me with my presentation. Again, the link to the speaker deck, I will leave it for 10 seconds. Yeah, it works great. Yeah, well, in the meantime, thank you. Thank you, Masia, for the presentation on JWT. That's great. You have at least five questions on the stage. So what do you want to do later? You know, check the chat. You can follow up the conversation here. So. Thank you very much. We're a little bit out of time, so I'll have to rush this a little bit. Let's say hi to Marcia. Thank you again.